is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Unspoiled, covering Doctor Who, Season 4, Episode 3, The Fires of Pompeii. In this episode, did I bring up Pompeii one time and be like, what would happen if there was something like Pompeii that they knew was going to happen that was terrible? I feel like this went through my mind at one point. And the answer is tragedy. This is a bummer. Also, Donna saying, I think we're going to need to talk about this, Mr. Spaceman is probably my favorite line in the show so far because she is just not having it at all. And I am having that she is not having it. Welcome to Unspoiled. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. And I'm Jamie. So yeah, this episode was really fun. I I, liked this one a lot. It was super focused. It was really weird. And ultimately rather sad. And Donna is like having a spine and it's wonderful. I do believe you asked something specifically about Pompeii. And I do believe that I deflected. Gotcha. That sounds right. Yeah, I feel like because I, I was like, I, this feels like something that I said at one point because I was joking around about like, what if such and such? Well, I think and we then, were talking about the whole fixed moments in time or f- yeah, like fixed incidents in time. And you said, well, like, what if they showed up at Pompeii? And I said, well, I don't know. It would depend. Is that a fixed moment in time? Yeah. Well. I guess uh, pretty much the writers are just like wildly spinning off ideas the way that I do when I record. (laughs) And they're just like, no, yeah, no, let's do that. All right, Pompeii, let's start this. Have you ever been to Pompeii? No, I have never been to anywhere in Europe other than uh, London and directly outside of London. Okay. My my old roommate went to Italy for like 10 days and did a detour from Rome to go to Pompeii because the whole reason she really agreed to go to Italy was to go to Pompeii. She was obsessed with it. And she stole some little stones and then had bad luck for a while. And I was like, it's because you took them from Pompeii. It's the rocks. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's real amateur, amateur hour. (laughs) That is some shit that anybody should know. They were just from, from like a street or something. It wasn't like she stole them from one of the preserved sites or anything but i was like yeah it just you seems don't like a know. bad form <laughs> yeah you don't know what that rock was like it's been a minute that could have seemed like a rock and been somebody's <laughs> bone people blew away they yeah. turned into ash like yeah. who the fuck knows what that was that was somebody's big toe you had in your the pocket there <laughs> I did ask her when she came out here to visit recently if she still had those rocks from Pompeii. And she was like, yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, you haven't had the best of luck like in oh, the last man. 20 years. At least not her love life. Like maybe it's the Pompeii Ouch. rocks. Jamie putting her <laughs> friend on blast right up on the podcast. Okay. She knows I love her. I've also been honest about this. I told her I need to vet all of her boyfriends because she has she makes bad choices. <laughs> She's like oh, my sister. God. I can say anything, so she doesn't ever hold it against me. She knows I'm right eventually. Eventually. <laughs> um. So yeah, this episode begins with uh, Donna asking all the questions that I would ask. I don't know why they haven't had a character like this to begin with, because it's a, it's just how people's minds work, or maybe it's just me. But like, sincerely, she comes out. He's like, oh, we're in ancient Rome. And she's like, this is wild. What? Awesome. And then sees that there's a sign that's in English. And she's immediately like, are you having me on? Are we in Epcot? (laughs) Which was, I love 
that idea. I want there to be a fan fiction out there in which the doctor is a fraud <laughs> and every place that he brings people is actually like some highly play- paid cosplay sort of like thing that he's doing in order to, I don't know, humiliate CEOs or do something to make it people think that they're on an adventure and so they act like banana pants. So and you want him to bring everybody to Westworld? Kind of, yeah. But like his Westworld that he just does like for revenge. Right. But like everything is a Westworld. Revenge world. Yeah. <laughs> Or some version of Westworld. Except not robots. Like, just people. Mm. You know. But how funny would that be if, like, people were like, oh, my God, we're on another planet. And he's, like, explaining away. Oh, yeah, we can totally breathe the air because of this uh, aura from the TARDIS. It's like the Doctor Who mixed with the Truman Show. Exactly. (laughs) And there's like, you know, crises and it's just sort of let's see what we can get them to do. And it's maybe a reality show for the super rich or something like this that they like watch a person just go banana pants. Plus thinking that the they're Hunger like, Games. Yeah, except that like, I don't know. Minus the that child big, killing. <laughs> well, I'm not averse to child killing, but <laughs> everybody can't know about it because then if you get like. You can't get conned, right? If it's this hugely popular thing. Yeah, that's true. So it has to be somewhat secret. Um, but yeah, so he explains that the TARDIS is translating for her. Uh, just makes it look like English. We're speaking Latin right now. And she's like, wait, what if I said something in Latin? And he's like, well, I mean, you could... Uh, try saying it to that guy over there and she goes up to the dude and he thinks that she's speaking Celt yeah Celtic which is is that is Celtic just a language is that a thing that's Um, what the like the Welsh because he even says she sounds Welsh the -hmm. Welsh language and um, there's a lot of Scottish and Irish that comes from the Celtic language I wasn't sure if, because I knew that um, the Celts were a people and that there was Celtic culture, but I just wasn't sure if there was just an actual language that was straight up just called Celtic. I think you can still learn it, kind of like learning Latin, but with more letters. Well, it doesn't work out. Yeah, this guy is just like, sorry, I don't, what are you saying? I don't speak that. What does Veni Vidi Vici mean? Oh, Krista knows. Krista speaks Latin. All I remember is that the dean says it in Vini Vidi Vici. All right, give me, come on here, Google. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, I came, I saw, I conquered. Right. Oh, so Caesar probably said it. I came, I saw, I conquered the idea of a free Caesar salad bar in the cafeteria. And that's the dean having been dressed up as Caesar for that announcement. From community? Very, very tiny Caesar outfit. Yes. <laughs> You're just saying the dean. People have to connect the dots. The dean is the dean from a community. big fan of wearing costumes for announcements that do not need a costume True. at all. He's a man after my own heart. <laughs> um, so, okay. Oh, your sidebar. But... The whole, like, she, when he's, when she's asking this stuff, the doctor is kind of like, man, you really do ask a lot of hard questions. And I'm like, doctor, has it not ever in your hundreds of years of travel occurred to you to ask this stuff? You're not curious? What do you, what do you do? I guess it's just not necessary for him to wonder about it. This is just the culture that he grew up with of being able to travel and understand and do all this sort of thing. Yeah. But I just can't get over the lack of curiosity there. You know, like it's sort of like when you are, when you're cooking and you are talking to a child and they're like, why don't you put gummy bears in there? And you're like, what? Just a thing that you would never think to do because you just know you don't put gummy bears in this. This is a terrible idea. That'd be terrible. Mm -hmm. But 
the kid is asking questions that you're like, what? How, why are you even asking this? That doesn't make any sense. I think that's why my brothers would freeze everything. They would like freeze stuff in the ice cube trays just because they wanted to see what happened. What happens is it gets it, frozen. Yes, it's but they exciting. were little kids. They were like five years old and I would go to get ice and there'd be like pennies frozen in the ice cube. Like, what are you doing? I just wanted to know, would the pennies change? Would the pennies change? Well, oh, bless you know, them. they had to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember um, a friend of mine had a ring that she wore that was like kind of round it was like a tube of metal around her finger. And I was convinced that when she put it on, the tube like rolled mm. down her finger as if it were like a bunch of beads on a string. Right. And you could not tell me otherwise. And when she let me try it and it didn't roll and it just like I was the most disappointed. <laughs> and I was not that young at that point. I was like in middle school. Um. So at this point, they're walking around. She's excited. And then all of a sudden, there's a boom. And the whole town shakes. City, I guess. And she's like, wait a second. Where are we? And the doctor says, Pompeii. And it's Volcano Day. And then we just go to the intro. And I was mm -hmm. like, sir, what are you doing here? What's what is the TARDIS doing sending you here on Volcano Day? This just feels malicious. But then it turns out there's a whole thing, yeah, that's uh, that is necessary here, and it's I, like the, here goes a story that I can get behind. This makes sense to me. But you know, we'll get there. <laughs> um. Meanwhile, there is some weirdo woman stalking them. Mm -hmm. in the uh, marketplace and she's got all this makeup around her eyes and it's just very, very mysterious. And when we see them later, there's like a whole bunch of them and they're sort of, they're seer slash priestesses kind of thing. And the two of them, the doctor and Donna are of course immediately like bye bye and run back to the TARDIS and the TARDIS is gone. Because somebody sold it because it was just sitting there, wasn't it? It was up in my space, so it's mine now. Yep. And that just really does not seem like uh, it should be allowed. If a guy just parks his horse, does does he just get to sell the horse? Well, I don't know. It was on my patch, wasn't it? I know in the Wild West, which this isn't, but... If somebody stole your horse, it was a pretty big deal. Yeah. I mean, that was part of one of my issues with um, an episode of Deadwood. I was like, they're about to execute somebody for stealing a horse. And somebody wrote in and was like, well, think about if you are isolated and something happens to you and you have no way to get to anybody. A horse is like crucial. And I was like, yeah, you're right. That's that's fair. Wasn't that the pilot? <sighs> yeah. The very first episode. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, this guy fucking sold it. And I can't help but think that, like, the TARDIS influenced him to steal and sell it. Because the TARDIS is, like, trying to get the doctor to stick around and figure out what's going on here. It's possible. Also, maybe wanted to get the doctor to this family. Mmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Because the guy who bought him... Bought him. <laughs> bought nah. it. Um... He's a marble merchant, mm -hmm. but he bought it because he thought it was modern art. <laughs> and Which, uh, all right, is sure. Cacilius, I think is how you say his name. I don't, don't remember. The, the father? Yeah. Cacilius? Cacilius? I think sure. it's Cacilius. They say it so fast, and so it's, I've never really been able to catch it and my notes mm -hmm. spell it out but i'm like okay i'm gonna listen to how they pronounce the c's at least right <laughs> and i'm pretty sure it was cacilius well the family like it didn't even occur to me that nobody in pompeii even knows what a volcano is yeah so i didn't these, know that like, either right like i that there's something about that that's so 
much more tragic that it's not something that happened all of a sudden without warning. They never saw it coming. There were tremors and they just had no idea what that meant. And probably there were tremors occasionally throughout a lot of people's lives here. Yeah, probably they just thought they were earthquakes. Yeah, exactly. And he says that because she Donna says something about how it like it doesn't look like a volcano. And he said the top hasn't blown off yet. Mm -hmm. So what they're seeing all this time is just a mountain. Right. They don't even know that it's a volcano. And he says they don't even have the word volcano in their vocabulary yet. Mm -hmm. So that's crazy to think about, too. That was the one line at the end that (laughs) I did not need. Why did they think that was a good idea? I don't know. I'm I'm not even going to try because I agree that was the moment where I was like, oh, boy. Right? Like, guys, we got it already. We got it within the first 10 minutes. It's like, fine. They, they say they have a god named Vulcan mm-hmm. and they keep referring to him whenever they're in the mountain. Th- that other guy keeps mm-hmm. saying, you know, Vulcan, god Vulcan or whatever. And we know as a society now that the study of volcanoes is volcanology. Mm -hmm. If you've watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you really know it because Andrew made that video thing where he was like, Faith was fighting Spock. Oh my God. (laughs) And then someone else is like, not that kind of Vulcan, you idiot. Um, (laughs) I forgot about that. (laughs) So we know that Vulcan is like the root of the word volcano. Mm-hmm. It's not necessary. And maybe it's to teach children. I don't know. But yeah, at that line at the end, I was like, okay, enough with this and your like, tears. Even if you're trying to teach children, you could do better than it's like some sort of volcano. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> no, because volcano is probably anglicized version of whatever their word for volcano was Mm -hmm. based on the word Vulcan. But. (laughs) Oh God. Anyway, but (laughs) so we go to this family's house. The father has bought this thing to be like impressive because they're going to be having these very important guests coming over to retrieve his daughter Because she is a seer. She is gifted with the sight. Mm -hmm. And she's going to be taken to be one of these priestesses. And has all already. She doesn't have like the. um, I guess it's paint. I don't think it's supposed to be tattoos. I think it is paint just on her face. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have that yet. But she does have the eyes on the backs of her hands. Yeah. And she is. Her mother is asking her. If she has consumed yet today. And she's like, well, no, it's morning. No, I have not. And her mom's like, come on, come on, come on. Go over here and get high. Let's do this. And it, we find out later that these fumes are turning her into a creature that is made of stone. And so a part of her arm is covered in what looks... It's like... Uh, weird sort of she has grayscale i was about to say what is the disease in game of thrones yeah it's grayscale where they turn the stone people when donna touches her arm jason was like don't touch it that's how you catch it exactly i was like you don't know what this is donna what are you doing (laughs) i was annoyed with her on that one she's not a fool she shouldn't be doing this kind of thing but it turns out that it's like a, a side effect from inhaling this like it's not just regular dirt or It's or not just ash. volcano like, dust. Yeah. It's like particles of these creatures, whatever these right. creatures are from this other planet. So they like came to Earth and they were in the form of rocks as they fell. And then they basically like turned to dust on impact. And the inhalation of the dust makes you into one of them. They like take over your body from that sort of yeah. access. Um, yeah, they're like little parasites. Yeah, which is a pretty cool idea. I like that. Um, 
And meanwhile, they have this son who is so uninterested in everything that everybody is doing. Ah, this this kid is really one of those that I don't want to like, and I like him anyway, and it annoys me. Because he, like, there is something about the earnestness of this show that so many characters are really, like, they have a purpose, and they're here to do a thing, and they believe something, and they talk about the beliefs that they have. And then there's this kid who's just like, nothing to do with me. And Mm -hmm. it's not until he, like, waves money in front of his face that he's like, oh, well, I mean, if that's how this is, that's a different story. Um, He also has been, like, partying the night before, so he's hungover. He's super hungover. (laughs) He's so funny to me. I just think that, uh, you know, it's – I I appreciate the fact that he is sort of like ambivalent, not only about his family, but also like the gods. There's a real idea that we have, I think, that everybody before a certain period took the idea of gods very seriously. Mm-hmm. And it's really, it's like, it was certainly more common because science hadn't started to step in and sort of for many people replace religion as an explanation for a lot of natural things. But there still were people who just didn't believe just because they were like, that doesn't really like, that doesn't work for me. Mm -mm." And him being told to like apologize to the household gods. And he goes over and does this real half hearted. I'm sorry, household gods. Like, I just found him very amusing, even though he was really irritating. Um, so meanwhile, out in the street, the doctor and, uh, and Donna are sort of arguing about what to do because she assumes that they are here to save everybody. That that's like the point is that the TARDIS brought them here on this day so that they could evacuate everybody and get them out of here and, and avoid this whole mess. And the doctor doesn't actually say until now uh, or until the end that there is a fixed point in time thing. He doesn't explain it here. He does. Oh wait, no. Yes, he does. My bad. I'm sorry. I'm seeing it. What happens, happens. There is no stopping it. But he doesn't explain what that means. He says it's a fixed point in time, but he doesn't really, like, tell her until later that he is one of the only beings who can see those things and knows what they are. And there's not really a way for him to explain to her how he knows or what makes something fixed and others not. That is just something that he has an inherent understanding of because of what he is. Yeah. And I liked that because if you even try to picture like – because he says that's how I see everything. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder like what is his vision actually like? Mm -hmm. Does he physically see everything everywhere he lands? Does certain time have an energy like landing in Pompeii? Does it have some sort of aura that he's like, oh, this can't be changed? Right. Yeah, that's interesting. It because, like- you know, like our history, when he says like, oh, Pompeii, that can't be changed as a fixed point in time. We mm-hmm. as human beings that live in, on Earth know what that means. Like, mm-hmm. well, yeah, I get it. It happened. But if he says that when they're in another place. Yeah, true. Like, how does, mm. the, how does the audience go? Okay. Yeah, I totally am. I, I, I'm on your side because you're right. It's, you know, we can do that with Pompeii. We know that happened. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. I really wonder, like, I, I want to know more about the training of Time Lords. Mm. You know, we have that whole thing with the kids getting to see the soul of the time the time vortex, vortex. Yeah. is that what it's called yeah um and i don't really know what that means or what that teaches them or what that uh what's the word 
just just what benefit that has on their training i'm not really clear on um if that opens a an a sight for them basically like it opens a third eye to be able to see this stuff do you know what i'm saying yeah what i'm trying to because it feels it's like a rite of passage but i'm just curious why because of the violent and sometimes devastating reactions that some of these kids have is it meant to be like sort of a test or are they born able to see this stuff like as children already do they know what fixed points in time are as like kids? It's a good question. I don't have an answer. I know when we posed the question to our audience when we were talking about that during that episode of like, do we know much about children time lords? Mm-hmm. Is that something that was in the older series? Um, the feedback really was that there wasn't a whole lot explained about it in the the original series. Okay, gotcha. So I'm not sure, and I can't remember offhand if that is something that gets explained later or not. So, because I don't remember everything about this show. It's not Friends. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, it's not Friends. I mean, I know that show inside out, but... You goober. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it'll be explained. I don't know. Um, so he figures out who bought the TARDIS and he goes and finds this family and tells them that his name is Spartacus, which is wonderful because then she says me too and kind of gives him a look like, yeah, what are you going to, what are you going to fucking say about it in front of this guy? Nothing. That's what, because this is stupid and I hate you. (laughs) And so... Mr. and Mrs. Spartacus. Which they're like, nope, nope, nope. (laughs) Brother and sister, you both look very much alike. Really? And once they turn in profile, they have the exact same nose, honestly. Do they? They have such a similar nose that I am stunned. I did not notice that. I didn't notice. Is this now the part of the show where you take a screen cap and send it to me? Oh, I should. Yeah. Hold on. Let me do it. (laughs) Let Isn't this everyone's favorite back. part of the show where we look at things that they can't see? Oh, it's so entertaining. That is good television <laughs> right there. That's good radio. Uh, oh, yeah. That's the one. <laughs> well, see, I'm excellent at my job. <laughs> I was listening to a podcast called Doug Loves Movies the other day, and they always have this prize bag because it's basically like a movie trivia game show. And the guests bring up stuff for the prize bag. And Justin Long was one of the guests. And he was talking about like, yeah, and if you look at this on this cover, blah, blah, blah. And Doug's like, yeah, you know, this is a podcast. And (laughs) even though you're in front of an audience, the people listening have no idea what you're talking about. So you're going to have to describe it. And not only are the people right in front of you. I mean, they can't necessarily see very well either. Yeah, it was a DVD so, cover, so it's like, what do you? Oh my maybe God. the front row can see what you're talking about, Justin. But I thought that was funny that Doug was like, "Let me dumb this down for you." <laughs> uh, I just sent it to you. It's like hard. I don't feel like I was able to stop it at a great point, like just exactly the right point. But I tried like three times, and kept missing. So this is as close as I'm going to get. Okay. But, um... I can yeah, kind they, of see what you mean. Yeah. They're, the rest of their faces are not shaped anything alike. But no. their noses are very similar. Um, But, yeah, brother and sister. She looks yes, very pretty in this screen cap, by the way. She's really cute in this whole episode. Yeah. Um, I feel like... I don't know. There's just something appealing about her in general that's yeah I, it's probably just because she's so funny and it just comes through you know yeah, but she is very pretty yes beyond that like she's not bad to look at they so, did um they did a shakespeare play together recently which, which I, one um they did much ado about nothing oh okay which i know we've had the discussion of shakespeare and you don't really like shakespeare and i do um i really would have loved to have seen them in that play yeah yeah i mean much ado about nothing i don't think i've ever read but i've seen 
the like two uh, adaptations. The movies. Yeah. The one with Emma Thompson and Keanu Reeves. No. Oh. <laughs> I think I saw one that was done by Joss Whedon. Was it in black and white? Oh yeah, I own that, and I have never watched it. That's funny. Yeah. Why not? I just kept forgetting, and I then I forgot all about it. But I like that um, cast. I really, I really like Much Ado About Nothing. It's one of my favorite of his plays. So Donna is like, uh, maybe we should. Give these two some kind of special getaway to get out of town, (laughs) you know, to just get away from it all and laying it on pretty thick. And she says something about the volcano and they're like, and the doctor's like, what are you doing? And has to drag her off to the side and tell her they don't know what a volcano is they don't even have a word for it and she says oh great they can learn a new word as they die (laughs) and he says donna stop it and she says because she's my queen forever i don't know what sort of kids you've been flying around with in outer space but you're not telling me to shut up that boy, how old is he? 16. And tomorrow he burns to death. And he says, is that my fault? And she says, right now? Yes. <sighs> Sweetheart, angel. <laughs> I have been waiting for you my whole unspoiled Doctor Who career. The tw- the two decades that I have been covering this show. <laughs> perhaps four decades. I don't know. I Time have is a flat needed circle. you to be a part of this, and I just I, I was destitute and thought it would never be, and then finally <laughs> you arrived, and you just are not interested in putting up with his shit, and it's just everything I ever needed. Thank you, thank you, Donna. Thank the household god, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> The god of sarcasm. Uh, the god of like, fuck you! I'll do what I'm, uh, what I want. Um, and you know, like, I like the fact that as much as the doctor tries to just say that we can't do anything, we're not doing this. You can see it bothers him to yeah. say no to her. Like he doesn't like being in the position where this isn't an, an, an option. And where no, he knows that no matter how he chooses to explain this, he's not coming out looking like a good guy. There's no way that he can explain this in a way that as a human being, she could really even understand it, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they get interrupted here by the introduction of Lucius. Who, Lucius Petrus Dextrus. This guy I could not take seriously <laughs> at all because he is the cab driver murderer, spoiler alert, in Sherlock. You remember this guy? I haven't watched Sherlock. Oh, right. Well, spoiler alert. He is a cab Great. driver. Now when I watch that episode, I'm like, oh, there's Lucius Petrus Dextrus. He's the killer. Well, listen, the thing is, though, who's the killer isn't even the climax of that episode. So I still think it's fine. But he is he is just so goofy looking mm-hmm. in his face that taking him seriously as any sort of threat or a leader, or anything of the kind, is not possible for me. He's too rosy-cheeked. He's got weird teeth. He's just kind of, like, got this, like, dull look to his eyes. I don't know. I looked him up because I knew I had seen him in something. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking what I remember him from other than this is Poldark. Yeah, that's right. I Because I was watching that the other day and I remember being like, oh, there's the campy from Sherlock. So, yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. Because that is who he is to me forever, I guess. Yeah, I didn't even remember seeing 
Sherlock. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I guess I just skimmed right past that when I was going through his IMDb. I thought there was something else that was notable. He was in being but... human? Oh, that was it. He's in being human, yeah. Yeah. I don't think I reached so... the episodes that he was in, though. I don't really remember him. Oh, my God. When did you stop? What? I don't remember where. I, I remember, remember him from that. As soon as I read it, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. But I can't remember which season it was. He must like Aiden Turner. Mm, who doesn't? Right? We watched this trailer. Sorry, quick sidebar. We watched this trailer for this movie called The Man Who Killed Hitler and Then Bigfoot. And then the Bigfoot. And it had Sam Sam Elliott in it. And I was like, wait, what the hell is this? So we watched the trailer and Aiden Turner's in it as well, playing a young <laughs> Sam Elliott, which, no. Oh, my God. What? But after the trailer was over, I was like, okay, that actually looks pretty good. But that's the worst title for a movie I've ever heard. I don't know what you're talking about. Nothing is going to get me interested. <laughs> like the man who killed Hitler and then the Bigfoot. <laughs> it actually looks really good, though. Like, like how... not in a cheesy way. Like, it looks like a pretty decent movie. <laughs> I'm not mad has about a it. a really terrible name. But it, Sam Elliott is so amazing in everything. And then Aiden Turner. I mean, yeah, I'm in. You guys all know how we feel about Aiden Turner. Yeah, hottest man to ever live. Oh yeah, and this guy was also in um in Midsummer Murders. So that's another thing that I've seen him that in. That would be something you'd seen him in, yeah. I haven't seen Again, every that. British actor has been in Midsummer Murders. <laughs> it's happened. Yeah. Um All right. So the this dude is insufferable. He comes in here with his fucking what do, what do they call these little bits of, like, pseudo-wisdom? It's soothsaying. But it's not. It's not. Because soothsaying is, like, the prediction of the future. And, you know. Well, this would, like, I guess, being be. A, a kind of an oracle. This, what they're seeing, because they're, it's like being a mind reader. No. What I'm talking about is, like, his answers to things like a a seed always knows where it will be planted oh, or some shit like that. Little, um, yeah, I was going to say profit. That's not the right word. Little shit. <laughs> Little shit. Called? Indeed. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Maxims. Is that the right word? That's not the word I was looking for. I'm going to look brain. up the word Maxim and see what that's, uh, no, not the men's magazine. Oh, why did I not see that coming? Okay, I'm going to go I'm to dictionary. Maxima, a short, pithy statement expressing a general truth or rule of conduct. Completely. That's exactly what I meant. So, okay. yes. He's speaking in maxims, except they are not meaningful. Like, there's nothing about them that's actually... It's it, He's doing the live, laugh, love, but, like, in conversation, basically. <laughs> And it's unacceptable. I like, think, no, I will not tolerate a person who talks like this. I think what I was thinking of is an aphorism, which is a synonym for maxim. Oh, all right. Perfect. Aphorism. Yeah. Well, I like it better because it's not the title of a men's magazine. So Not yet. <laughs> uh, why, why would you? Can you imagine our new magazine, <laughs> Aphorism? You'd have it a bunch of really filthy. dumb dudes that'd be like, what is that? Oh, it's got hot chicks <laughs> in it, though. <laughs> Um, and yeah, he comes in and is talking about like the wind and the birds, only the grain of wheat knows where it will grow. Yeah. And the, this fucking goober is like, Matella, have you ever heard such wisdom? And I love her because she takes him in and then just says, never. And I'm like, correct. You still haven't. <laughs> um, and does her best to make her husband happy by saying, oh, it's an honor. Because this is the guy who's about to, like, take her daughter, I guess. Well, no, the daughter is going to go to the Sisters of Sibilance. Is he not Sibylline part of that? No, he's something else. Okay. He's also a soothsayer, but he, like, when they get brought up, he's like, ugh, they're false. 
Oh, so they're like getting turned into things that he is also getting turned into, but he doesn't actually. So is that the remaining part of like his human personality? Yeah, Pretty maybe. much like his bias against because I would have thought that they were all on the same side. Now he's because he thinks that he's like been given this power by a god, uh, of and they he does. they think that as well, but it's a different god. It's like because they're they're kind of worshiping this woman who's turning into stone, and when the doctor hears the name, he's like, "No, I knew Sybil, and she wasn't about this." Mm, right. He knew Sybil. I bet he did. <laughs> but I do like all this stuff that this dude says when he's like, I can see your real... Or no, I think it's her, the daughter of Evelina, mm-hmm. that says, I can see your real names. And But he mentions Gallifrey in London and talks about like seeing Gallifrey burning. Yeah. And she talks about the doctor... That's not even your name. Your actual name is written in the stars of the Medusa Cascade. It's like all this cool stuff that's giving us information about the Doctor and his history without being too like Revealing. obvious about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not like an info dump. Right. It's just like little breadcrumbs of information. I forgot about the like Maxim off that they have. Because he says something and then the doctor like comes back at him with something else and he tries to argue and the doctor says, well, the wind is felt most keenly in the dark. Dark. But what is the dark other than an omen of the sun? I concede that every sun must set and yet the sun of the father must also rise. (laughs) Damn. Very clever, sir. Evidently a man of learning. (laughs) <laughs> who are you who are so wise in the ways of science? Ah, oh, this is so g- I I just I was just talking about this with Rashawn, the trap that you can fall into where somebody says something that is on its surface true and therefore sounds very what's the word I want profound and you like it or share it and then you stop and you really think about it and you're like wait that's nothing what is a what is the dark other than an omen of the sun no it's not it's really not it's 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 the lack of light Mm -hmm. and the dark doesn't even have to do with the sun necessarily like it could just be like what you're saying is you hate poetry Mostly. Yeah. yeah. Me too. <laughs> I mostly do hate poetry. Like there's some exceptions. There are some yeah. poems that I've read and been really moved by. But most of the time I'm just like, just fucking say what you came to say. Can you stop it with this bullshit? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I why I get frustrated with books that were written a long time ago because language has evolved. And they say 50 words to say five Mm-hmm. And I hate it. Yeah, I feel like that was a um, complaint that you had about Little Women. It was. I found really funny because that book to me does not have much poetry in it that, or to it. I that say. book, I think my – I mean I did have that complaint about parts of that book because it's also with the era that it was written in, they were still sort of saying more to say very little. Mm. But it's not as bad as like – when I tried to read Dickens. Oh, God. Dickens was trying his best. But, guys, don't come at me, but Dickens really. Oh, we did talked too about much. this when we had that episode with Charles Dickens in it. That's true. I forgot that that happened. Yeah. yeah we are oh, not bless fans. Him. Yeah. He's, a, he's, <laughs> he's an, another over earnest one. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, evidently a man of learning. Um, (laughs) don't mind me. Don't want to disturb the status quo. He's Celtic. Uh, I love these little moments because they're peppered in here and there with him saying something of the time. And yet, because he's, you know, it just doesn't work, even though it is actually their language and where it comes from. Um, 
But so, yeah, they are saying, he's saying like, we're going to be off in a minute. And he's trying to steer Donna back to the TARDIS. And as they're about to get on this, like square of, uh, is it supposed to be marble? Cause it looks like yeah. metal to me. It's, he's like a marble, the guy, Kikalius, he's a marble merchant. And I think this guy, like, has made his money in carving marble mm, or something. Okay. Because he's carving these, like, they look like chips, like right. computer chips. Mm -hmm. And he's been carving these things into this marble. I don't know how they made it green. But I'm not an expert on marble, so maybe there is green marble. No idea. There's definitely green marble. Yeah, that that exists. Okay. It was just so it, it's so shiny. Yeah. And the like the tone of it, it almost looks reflective. So I thought that it was um, metal. But yeah, I'm looking at it closer now and realizing, oh, okay. It's and really funny is... later when the doctor is supposed to be like lifting these big, you know, slabs of marble to like arrange them, mm -hmm. and he's like, ugh. And I can tell, like, that's ah, plaster. Yeah, that did not weigh anything. <laughs> um, and this is when the daughter comes in and first says they're laughing at us. And I was like, you know, for somebody who's really accurate about everything else later on in this scene, they're not laughing at that moment. It's a no, weird thing to say. I think it's that because way. their conversation that between the two of them is it has a tone to it that's probably not very familiar mm. to them, and so she's interpreting it as they're making fun of us. Got it. All right, I could see that. It's like the paranoia anytime you're around a group of people who all speak a language that you don't and every time they like drop into it you're like are you talking about me what do they say they i actually me. worked at a french bakery that was owned by a lebanese family and they would talk about me in lebanese uh and i could always tell would. that they were talking about me because they weren't hiding it <laughs> they're just looking at you like yeah what are you gonna do about it kind of yeah i could see that that would be a horrible temptation if you're around a bunch of people who all speak your language and you want to say something about the person that's right in front of you and you know you can just do it and they're never going to be able to tell what you said. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think I could resist it. <laughs> I think I would do it. Um, but, yeah, at this point, the daughter, this is when she says all of the stuff about his name being hidden that the doctor isn't the real name he says something the doctor about how the uh daughter is better at this than him mm -hmm. because this guy tries to be like only men folk have the power of the sight yada 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 and then the guy is like oh really you think she's better at this than i am mr gallifrey yeah and the doctor's like wait what hold on wait what and it becomes very clear that there is a whole other thing going on. But even this isn't exactly enough to get the doctor like completely on board. Yeah. He has to be convinced later that they are, they are a threat to the well-being of the entire planet. Which um, I guess is like some sort of code he lives by. But I don't feel like I necessarily knew that. Well... Because it comes down to a choice he has to make to either save this 20,000 people and let these monsters rise or save the entire planet Earth. And right. when, when that's your choice, I'm not going to let there be a like extinction level event. So I guess I have to – it's the it's the trolley problem. Right. Yeah. I mean it's not like – yeah – Hmm. Oh, like, I don't know I forgot. if this guy says there's something on your back. Yeah, he says that to Donna. To Donna? Do we get an explanation about that? No. Okay. That's interesting. Hmm. I wonder what that means. I don't know. Then uh, Evelina faints. Oh, what, yeah. What she looks that? like a mess. Yeah. It's like she has to inhale this alien dust and her body is like, I hate this. It gives me the flu every day. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's actually a pretty good actress because she looks really young. Mm-hmm. You know, she looks like she's like 17, 18 years old. But uh, she really pulls off this whole like ill, suffering, dramatic moment without it feeling at all silly. Yeah. She looks like pretty upsetting, honestly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, she says, you are a lord, sir, a lord of time. And he's staring at her like, what the fuck? And then she goes down. And meanwhile, the whole place is shaking because the, you know, volcano is doing its thing still. Um, and I didn't really talk about it, but we get a look at the priestesses discussing that the doctor called the mad and... Mm-hmm. Like, just kind of talking about prophets, and eventually there is a conversation between the daughter and Donna, and Donna is trying to tell her about the volcano, and there isn't really, like, she can't get through, because this girl well, because- has been trained to believe that the prophecies are only coming from this one weirdo source that's, like, taking over her body. Yeah, and when Donna's like, well, what does what do you see for tomorrow? Mm-hmm. And she doesn't see anything. It's, oh, the sun rises, the sun sets. Yeah. It's like, well, <laughs> then why, when I, you know, I, Donna Noble, know that this terrible thing is going to happen, why can't mm-hmm. these people see it? Yeah. And this is happening at the same time as the doctor is having a chat with her father and finding out that, like, these soothsayers did not used to be this good at their job. Right. They most definitely were very, like, often inaccurate and just kind of talking in riddles. And now all of a sudden, they are dead on all the time. They mm-hmm. are predicting weather. They are, like, just constantly on point. And so people are paying a lot more credence to everything they say. And the doctor is very interested in this sudden change and wondering what this means, as are we. Mm-hmm. And he says again, Did they say anything about tomorrow? No. Why? Should they? No, no, just curious, just asking. <sighs> Sir. <laughs> and uh, he finds out about the dust and the fact that they are inhaling Vesuvius. Mm-hmm. They're breathing it in. But he still doesn't know what that means. Right. Um, So he wants to go and find this Lucius fellow. Doesn't know where he lives. Goes to the son who does not give a fuck and offers him money to tell him and goes and tries to break into this guy's house. Gets caught and is nevertheless shown that there is another piece of that whatever kind of like circuit board Mm -hmm. that this guy is commissioning to be built by the one dude. He's having it done by a couple of others, which uh, he had told the cat. What's his name again? Kekalius. Kekalius. He had told him that he was like the only one. I don't know. It's I'll call him cat. (laughs) He was told that he was the only one. And uh, it turns out this guy is totally cheating on him with a bunch of different marbleists, marblers, yeah. marbellions, mm, marble merchants. Mm. 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 No, nope. rock come up with collectors. Anything. Lame. <laughs> <laughs> um. And yeah, they're all being put together, and uh, there's obviously something afoot here. And it is a, I just, I still was just like, I don't understand. Obviously, there's like some sort of weird alien influence. These, um, these priestesses are in for a bad shock because they're worshiping somebody who is behind a veil that we, the audience, never get to see. So obviously, once we find out who that is, it's going to be bad news. And sure enough, once we do, it turns out to be a priestess that has been taken over almost completely by this stone like parasite yeah and thinks that this is like a gift from the gods that this has happened to her that this is like they're working through her 
It's really some of the worst makeup I've seen on this show, though. You know, I f- even though the makeup was not good, it does look like, in some ways, like a disease. Yeah. Like it's sitting on it's, top of her skin. It's so just it, it the works weirdly. Face, the face just looks like they... Like really poorly animated, like computer animated face to me. Okay, I see what you're saying. And it kept taking um, me out of it because I wanted her to look more stone like, and it just looks like a rubber mask that they're computer animating to move, but it moves like a puppet. Yeah. Hmm. I did not. It's funny because I find this happens all the time. I will not really have a problem with the thing, but everybody else will have noticed. Like, (laughs) this will happen on Walking Dead or shows that use a lot of, like, CGI fire or CGI blood. And I don't even at all realize that it was CGI. And meanwhile, Owen's next to me being like, man, that was some really bad CGI on that fire. And I'm like, wait, that was CGI? Like, completely didn't even realize. But... This like the makeup for some of these, I really am just like, what are you doing? But then this one totally didn't really even notice, huh. and yet it bothered you. I just uh, feel like I have a weird blind spot sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, is it? I wasn't sure if I was interpreting this correctly. Does Lucius not know what he's commissioning? I don't think he does. Okay. That's what I thought. Because I couldn't tell if, like, this thing had succeeded in taking him over so much that it was, like, basically using him as a puppet to get the thing done. Or if it was pulling his strings to make him do a thing and he was simply not questioning it because he assumed that it was a god. But it, And it's pretty much that one, the second one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, And the doctor... Eventually, when he the guy when Lucius is like kill these guys, the doctor's like oh, but I respect you. Come on, shake my hand, and he doesn't move at all. And then the doctor darts forward and yanks his stone arm off, which just feels rude. I don't, you don't go yanking people's arms off. <laughs> Manners, excuse me. Um, and they go running out of there, and the thing gets broken. And it has to be fixed, remade, whatever. And he gets on his knees and begins to pray to whatever God he thinks this is to show himself. And we see something moving way down in the fire, looking up. And it looks like a suit of armor come to life, pretty much. And it invades the house that they're in through, like, a well, kind of? It's like a fire pit well thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Like, is it supposed to be that the people of Pompeii are channeling the volcanic fire from under them? Um, I don't think everybody. Yeah. It was just sort of a weird, it's like the, the hot springs underneath Winterfell, you know? Yeah. It sort of felt like we were, because that's what it looks like Lucius is praying to later as well, was the, like, was something that goes into the depths of the, uh, the ground and into the actual heart of the fire of the earth, pretty much, you know? Yeah. But maybe it was, maybe the cutaway was to inside the earth rather than inside the fire pit, which is how I initially took it. Yeah, I I think it cuts into the earth. Okay. Because this is like underneath the, like coming from underneath or inside of the volcano. Um, All right. Well, it never, and nevertheless, this thing does enter their house through the fire pit. So because yeah, it's under it's chasing them underground. The doctor says that that he's hearing the footsteps from beneath the ground. Right. 
Um, it's the, like a pretty cool idea if only it didn't just take a half gallon of water to completely put them out of commission. <laughs> it is so little water and this thing just goes down like a like a pile of rocks. Wow. And wow. as did that joke. <laughs> um, I felt so bad. I was my mom just discovered um, James McAvoy. Oh, really? She is now in love with. Yes. <laughs> and she sent me an interview that he did on uh, the Colbert Report or not the Colbert Report, but the late show. Yeah. And he tells some he says some joke and the audience does not even like titter. There's no response to this joke. It is embarrassing. And then he says, well, that went down like a cold, like a cold gulp of sick or something like that, <laughs> which again, nobody laughed <laughs> at all. Not even Steven. Like Steven didn't even like try and like engage on that joke, just moved right on. And they're like watching somebody try a joke that isn't even that bad. It wasn't a bad joke. I thought it was actually kind of funny. And it just not work out. Is that is there anything like more awkward? No. What I'm saying is, audience, I'm sorry for what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies to all of you. Oh, I've got um, less than 20 minutes. Oh, no. We are so far away. Okay. <laughs> sorry, guys. I have a heart out today. I usually don't. I really, you need to stop calling it that because I definitely don't hear those words. That's a, it's a term I picked up from working in Hollywood. I'm sorry. It's very, very sexual. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, all right. So speeding it along, Donna gets kidnapped. These women try and uh, kill her. Meanwhile, Donna is raging at them and completely defiant, and it is hilarious. I can't the doctor, understand why they want to kill her. They think she's a false she's prophet. Because she's a false prophet. She's okay. out here telling what's going to happen, and the things that are taking over want her to not be giving the game away, because they need all these people to stay put. Right? Right. So I guess they're trying to get rid of somebody who knows what's going to happen. And the doctor, this is when he's like, you know, he swoops in. I knew what's her face. She's never going to, uh, she's not going to be proud of what you're doing here. Um, and he helps Donna get out of the ropes with his uh, sonic screwdriver, to which one of them is like, what magic is this? And reveals the stone... A uh, priestess who is just like, he, I, love when, I think, is it him that asks, is it painful? And she just kind of goes, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, man, can't even admit that it hurts like a motherfucker. <laughs> um, and there is uh, finally the big, he, I'm, I'm just speeding ahead here. The decision that he has to make because yeah. he finds out that what they're doing is trying to take over what are these creatures called pyroviles that's cool i like that name um that they're going to basically take over humankind and he's like you know this this planet's got a lot of water on it and they're like it boils it'll boil away and everything that he says, they just say some other shit about how they can just fucking destroy whatever's in their way. And he's like, all right, well noted. So we can just, uh, we could just put it down to you trying to take over the world then. And he has to go and talk to Donna about the new choice in front of him and her realizing the, you know, what they're going to have to live with here. And he makes his choice. She makes it with him. True. They both, like, they pull a lever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, push a lever. And they do it together. Mm -hmm. and so that it's on both of them. Like, they had to make this decision, but it's the right decision. It's either 
20,000 people who will end up dying mm-hmm. anyway. Or it's the entire planet and the history of the world. Right. Yeah. It's a lot. And they go running from there to the TARDIS. And they have to run through the house of this family that they just got to know. Who are cowering on the floor crying. And Donna is just like. We can't just leave them. And the doctor's like, the hell we can't. We made our choice. We got to go. And Donna is really distraught. Her acting here was so good. I just loved it so much. She is like looking at him and just says, you don't have to save everyone. Just save someone. Yeah. And really is frantic. And he has this, like, expression before where he's just like, don't you understand that I would do that if I could do that, if I could save everybody? And she's like, well, you can't. Okay, fine. But just do what you can do then, you know? Stop focusing on the fact that what you want to do is impossible and look at what you can accomplish if you just shorten your sight a little bit from the big picture. And... uh I like this moment because the doctor, I have often complained about him feeling very distant. And it was nice to see him break a little bit here, Uh you know, Um, and really obviously be struggling with this decision. Because there are times where it feels like the show wants us to think he's struggling with a decision and I'm not really buying it. It doesn't feel like it was that difficult for him. And... This is one where when he breaks, it feels a lot more genuine. It feels like, yeah, this is fucking him up, actually. And that's part of why he is seeming so distant right now is this is his like coping mechanism is pulling back. Yeah, he compartmentalizes it. Mm -hmm. Which I can identify with personally. Um, So, yeah, then when he when she says not the whole town, just save someone and he looks at her and you can see that there's an expression on his face of kind of like, you know what? Shit. That's not a terrible plan. And then we hear the TARDIS sound and the family is all gathered up together. And he comes in and says, all right, come with me and leads them in as there's like ash pouring down on them and everything and carries them to like a distant hillside where they can see what's happening to this city and it's really awful like there's they're watching everybody that they know die yeah and i appreciated that the show really pulled back on the score because that has been a major problem for me in other episodes is like the music that they play in scenes like this is so inappropriate or so over the top that it just feels like they want me to feel something And they do not trust their actors or their writers to accomplish that. And so they're relying on this manipulation to do it instead. And this this moment really worked and they didn't go over the top with it in that way. Yeah. And it genuinely felt tragic. And everybody who acted in this scene, like I felt, did a really great job except for it's like some kind of volcano. (laughs) <laughs> which, uh, you know, kind of ruined it after a minute. But we had a second where it was just, you know, a bunch of people watching the worst thing happen. And I don't know. It was just sort of, especially because, you know, yesterday was uh, 9-11. So there's this sort of feeling of like being on, like s- totally helpless and watching a thing from afar. Yeah. That is affecting a huge city full of people that felt very poignant at this moment. I didn't even think Um, about that. And we jump forward in time a bit, six months later, and they have like settled somewhere else. The son has decided to become a doctor in Rome, right? Um, And their household gods are Donna and the doctor uh, with their little box and they're carved in this piece of marble and it's precious. Even though the doctor told them you can never 
you can't say anything. I wasn't here. Mm hmm. Yeah. Which I'm like, I wonder how many people are going to see this or believe it or what? Like, is this a secret? It feels like it's right out in their house. If anybody comes to visit, they'll see it. Right. What is that? Yeah. Oh, it's just something we made up. It's our household gods. We decided to give them a, a box in the middle. <laughs> Put some windows in it. <laughs> Man. So, yeah, he goes back into the TARDIS and is being real weird with Donna. The way that he is when he is emotional and does not know how to handle it. And she says, thank you. And he just says, yeah. And I'm like, dude, you need you need therapy. You need he, some help. He also friend. says that she was right and that sometimes he does need someone. He needs more than a someone. He needs <laughs> professional help. He needs somebody that he can, like, learn how to cope because he's clearly bad at it. And she helped him, like, make a better decision. But the way that he deals with his emotions is something that she can't help him with. You know? like. Yeah. He, he, yeah, he, he needs help. He needs help. <laughs> um, so you like this episode? I like this episode a lot. Yeah. yeah. I just thought it because, you know, I've asked before about like, if there is a fixed moment, like I asked this about the Titanic episode. Mm -hmm. If he's on Titanic, like we know that it sank. What are they? How are they going to do this? And the answer is make it so that this thing has to happen because of there being a choice between this or something even worse. Yeah. And that's really smart, you know, make it be like the price that has to be paid for such and such. And that way you don't have to be like, well, I guess Doctor Who is definitely not real because we know <laughs> that Pompeii was buried and on the show it was saved. But we know it wasn't. So I guess the show is a lie. Oh, my God. It's fiction. How dare but they, you know, I get the impression they really don't want to do that. They don't want to have alternate histories. Yeah. Not so. entirely. Right. Exactly. They'll have, you know, the doctor giving Shakespeare some lines to use, but we all know Shakespeare stole from other people, so. Hey, nanny, nanny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have two little quick pieces of trivia. One is that according to David Tennant on the episode commentary, when the doctor breaks off Lucius's arm... The original script had the doctor throw it on the ground and break it into pieces, but Tennant requested that this part be taken out because he felt it was too violent and destructive for the doctor. And both hmm. he and Catherine Tate still consider the final cut to be aggressive by the doctor's usual standards. Hmm. Yeah. So breaking off his arm in general, I think they both were like, that's a little much. Yeah, it does seem kind of... I... I wasn't bothered by it, but I was kind of surprised that he was like, just yanked it off yeah. and like held it up. And I was like, Oh, okay. I'm fine with it. Personally. I wouldn't have had a problem with him breaking it into pieces either. Honestly, <laughs> but I did notice it. Um, the other thing is that Cacilius's Cacilius's purchase of the TARDIS in the belief that it's a work of modern art is a deliberate reference to City of Death, one of the episode writer's favorite stories from the classic series. Mm. In City of Death, the TARDIS is parked in an art gallery causing a pair of critics, played by John Cleese and Eleanor Braun, to discuss its artistic merits before being even more impressed when it dematerializes in front of them. Nice. I that just, sounds like a fun scene. Yeah, and I just like that John Cleese was in a Doctor Who episode. That's fun. Right? Yeah, definitely. I love John Cleese. That's funny. And that's it. We have no reviews. Nobody from Game of Thrones or Harry Potter was in this episode. So no, <laughs> no bingo update. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I need to add a Midsummer Murders. <laughs> but you don't watch that. So yeah. it, doesn't, it won't mean anything to you. Tragic. I mean, it... it probably would have worked if we had thought about it because it maybe would have made the bingo a little bit harder a lot of people have already figured out like oh it's gonna be like this many before i even have a bingo but i just like the idea of playing along right yeah no i like the idea i think it's fun um all right well i wanted to i did i make the book club announcement here i don't 
I don't know. Well, I'm just going to say real quick, um, because I can't remember. I know I did on on, um, Dresden Files, but those of you who did not see the announcement on Facebook or on Twitter, I am going to be doing away with the Unspoiled Book Club. I was just having a lot of trouble getting co-hosts that were actually able to show up when they said... I was having a lot of trouble with doing um, the Spoil Me episodes now with fitting in the reading around that. The last book that I covered, which I still have not edited and posted, I'm sorry, guys, I'm planning our wedding and I am having to do a lot of this right away because I'm traveling to Orlando to get it all set up. So I'm having to sort of cram and everything else is falling behind. So last week's episode will have gone up late and my apologies for that. But um. I really had to listen to the audiobook for Imagica every spare second that I had because it was 40 hours long in order to get it done in time. And I still only finished the book half an hour before the recording started. And then the recording wound up being over two hours long. It was like two and a half hours. And I don't get that many listeners for the book club. It's just not that popular. And I think a part of it is the draw of unspoiled is, you know, joining in with somebody as they read a thing and the book club doesn't give you that it's done and over, you know? So I just felt like it was a lot of, of time and energy and mental labor that wasn't really paying off in terms of getting new listeners or getting people involved. I did the crowd casts live because people said that they would like to hang out and talk about it. And then those really were not attended very much at all. Um, so I just decided that it would be a lot easier for me to do away with them and open up the slots that had been for book club to spoil me commissions, because a lot more people are following along with spoil me as a book club sort of substitute. And, I'm not going to be covering any more books this year except for James and the Giant Peach, which I'm going to be doing with the gentleman from Overdue. And that's going to be the last book club of the year. So just wanted to let you all know, I'm sorry that, you know, some people have said that they're really going to miss it and apologies, but can only do so much. And I have to put my energy to where it's being repaid. And uh, I think that there's, I have so much content that there were people legitimately saying, if you cut back, I'll be glad because I'm already not keeping up with everything you do, <laughs> which I was stunned by um, that I have gotten to a point where I'm making too much for some people. But there it is. So I just wanted to let you all know that. And, uh, you know, my apologies on how kind of abrupt it was because I could have like gone to the end of the year and then decided to end it. But when I thought about doing away with it, and I really like imagined not having to do the, like all the reading, I felt this huge weight lift off my, my shoulders. And I was like, Oh, God, okay, that's my answer. Then if I feel such deep relief at the idea of not having to do this, I really should just cancel it. And I feel good about the decision. I already am like, it's it's already paying off for me mentally. Um, well, and you do spoil me. So if somebody if there's something somebody really really wants you to read, mm-hmm. they can commission it. Exactly. Um, and also, uh, speaking of the wedding, because that is what's kind of I I posted this on Facebook, but I want to thank all of you who have been uh, who became patrons or have commissioned spoil me episodes because I, a year and a half ago, Owen proposed and we just looked into what it would cost to have a wedding. And we were just like, well, guess we're not having a wedding because it's insane. And a lot of people have options where they're like, just do something, you know, where your family brings food and it's a potluck at a thing. And it's like, that's not really an option for us because of what our how our families are structured and where we live in relation to our families. We don't have that kind of support system where we could do something in that way. And I we sort of said that we were going to have a really small ceremony with just our parents and 
Rashawn was going to officiate. And then we started to talk about it. And I really looked at my money and the like way that business has improved. And I suddenly realized that I'm able to put away a lot more than I was before. And I can have a wedding and it'll have to be small, but it's still like, you know, it's a, it's a, I got really emotional talking about it yesterday with Owen because it's such a cliche about, you know, the little girl who dreamed what her wedding would be like. I a hundred percent did though. I love parties. I love planning. I love being the center of attention. Are you kidding me? Planning a <laughs> wedding was like everything. I thought about it all the time. And the older I got and the more I understood just how much that stuff costs, the more I had to let go of that. And it was a bummer. You know, I married Brendan and there were only 20 people there and we did like a sit down dinner with no dancing and no like it was not what I wanted, but it was what we could do. And I couldn't help feeling disappointed by it. And I was bummed that I wasn't going to get to do that with Owen either. And not only is the wedding itself such a like huge amount of fun that I thought I was going to miss out on. But two other things. One, there's the planning of it with like meeting with caterers and trying cakes and getting like makeup tests done that you see in movies and in TV shows characters doing. And I always thought how cool that would be to be able to do that sort of thing. And I just figured that was completely that was for upper middle class people. That was not for me. I was not of the, that group uh, in society that could experience things that way. And I'm getting to do that unexpectedly. Like we, I'm, I'm, I found a dirt cheap flight to Orlando and I'm setting up meetings with caterers and cake pl places within two days. I'm meeting with uh, nine different people. And I never thought I'd get to do this. And it's entirely because of you all supporting the show. It, that 100%. It is – I am in a place where I – my income is what's making the difference. And I just didn't expect that to happen so soon um, with like with Spoil Me having just started a year ago. And not only that, but I asked Jamie day before yesterday – to be one of my bridesmaids. I asked Krista as well to be one of my bridesmaids. Rashawn is still going to officiate the wedding. Multicolored I robes. Oh, don't even. Nope. <laughs> it's a friend's joke, guys. For those who were like, what, what is she yelling? And I am having at least like 20 people who are friends now because of the show. 100% only know them because of unspoiled. And that is also a massive difference from when I first got married to Brendan. We had 20 people because I really didn't have that many friends that I was close enough to that I cared if they were at my wedding. I really wasn't worried about it. You know, I have a couple people that are in the wedding photos from that wedding that I don't speak to and haven't for over five years, in one case, a decade. And they were close enough friends at the time for me to b include them on my list of like eight people I could invite, which is crazy. And now it, I have so many people that I want to invite so many people that are a huge, important part of my life. And I just, it's just, things have changed. It's like an about face and it's like a hundred percent because of you all. And I'm sorry, Jamie, I just realized I'm talking and you have to go. It's okay. It's important. I'm sorry. But thank you all so, so much. Like, so, um, thank you to Gabriella, Iman, Aaron, Mary, Alex, Jessica, Kayla, Amanda, Dana, Garrett, Squidward's grumpier cousin, Chris <laughs> Goodnight, and Michelle, all for becoming patrons over this past week. Thank you, Appreci guys. Appreciate you guys so, so much. And, uh, all right, I'm going to let you all go, but I just wanted to tell you that. It's just, uh, I'm shocked that I didn't cry talking about it because I feel like I'm going to, but I meant I'm glad it. you didn't because I cry when people cry. It's, ugh. I you should have heard me talking to Owen yesterday. I could barely speak. I was like, it just means a lot to me because I didn't think that. And he was just like, are you okay? 
And I was like, I'm just so happy. I was like, oh my God, I was like a sloth. <laughs> You're Chris, uh, you Kristen Bell did. It's great. I was like Kristen Bell. <laughs> oh, I, right. After you asked me, I after we got off of Skype, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be a bridesmaid at her wedding. And I was like, I kind of expected to be invited to the wedding, but to be asked to be a bridesmaid is such an honor. And I probably didn't express it exactly well when we were talking, but I'm so honored to be asked. Thank you so much. Can't wait. <laughs> I'm just so I'm so happy that I'm in a place where I'm like, oh, oh, I know I have several friends that I would like to be like, it's just yeah. things are just so different for me now. And it's, it's lovely. Great. It's going to be a really good time. I'm so excited. <laughs> <sighs> okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you all again so much for listening. Sorry for being late last week. Won't happen again. Lying. <laughs> and I will see you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye. Spoiled Network Podcast.